Uh, and actually, you know, I, I think we're going to get started. So uh, uh, hello, everyone on the uh, on the, the podcast audience. Uh, yeah, as Henry said, my name is Bromore and uh, Henry is uh, here today. I'm, I'm being a get, guest host today for the Henry Lee Show. And uh, we're going to get started. Um, today we have Eve Engler. Uh, if you don't know who Eve Engler is, you will you'll know shortly and maybe you will you'll remember uh, after we do this in this introduction part. So uh, hello, Mr. Engler. How are you? Not bad. How's it going? It's going well. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, so let's get started. Mr. Engler, um, let's talk about Concordia University <laughs> for a second, okay? So you are you became, uh, I mean, you, you were known before, but you became really famous after basically getting expelled from Concordia University, effectively, uh, after um, you were accused of starting a riot when Mr. Netanyahu came uh, to give us uh, a talk there. Uh, so... Can you tell us your side of the story about that? I'm really curious about that. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, elected into the uh, Concordia Student Union um, a vice, as a vice president. Um, we were elected, uh, it was the fourth year of a quite activist, left-wing oriented uh, student unions uh, at Concordia, the Concordia Student Union. And uh, the year before I was there, the administration had already began a process of really targeting the student union and actually tried to expel two members of the student union the previous year to my year. And so they really wanted to, they wanted to, uh, to basically clean house because the uh, student union was, was a, a thorn in their side. There was a Palestine component to it, an important Palestine component to that as well. The sort of pro-Israel groups wanting to, uh, to snuff out uh, pro-Palestinian activism. Uh, and then they, uh, early in our year, the Asper foundation, which was, uh, Run by uh, named after uh, Izzy Asper, the owner of the Can West newspaper, who was a you know staunch anti-Palestinian uh, individual. Uh, they brought uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who at that, who at that point was a, was a former Israeli prime minister. He was not the sitting prime minister at the time. Right, right. Uh, they brought him to Concordia, and uh, they demanded that um, he speak downtown in the hall building in like the big H one ten there, right in right um, right off of Mezzanine Street. And it was very provocative. It was understood to be very provocative. It was understood to be a sort of a response, as, as some people put it. Uh, they brought him into the what they called the viper's nest, because uh, it was apparently the pro-Palestinian activism was, uh, you know, we were we were vipers, right. which I think was a quite a racist uh, a framing of things. But um, so Netanyahu uh, tried to speak. Uh, there was major protests. Uh, there was all kinds of. I mean, get into thousand details about security dynamics and what the head of security at Concordia said, do not do this downtown. And then the police, they didn't, they brought the police in, but they only brought the police in in a small amount and, and, it, and things escalated. And uh, Netanyahu was ultimately unable to speak. The, the police, Montreal police released certainly uh, pepper spray, possibly tear gas inside of the hall building, which led to thousands of students being, um, being had having to be evacuated from the building and uh, riot squad <laughs> roaming around inside the hall building. And uh, in the aftermath of that, they targeted a number of people. They, they brought in these really uh, intense restrictions after the Netanyahu protests, where they basically tried to bar uh, activism in the hall building. And they, and they also even brought in these restrictions that you couldn't speak about Israel-Palestine uh, issue. To the point where if you were in a Middle East politics class, you were supposed to have to actually ask the teacher if you could ask a question that's uh, related to the Israel-Palestine or the Palestinian you know, conflict. And anyways, I, they, 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 about a month after the Nanya protest, I was arrested for handing out leaflets against the free trade area in the Americas. There was a protest coming up and it was our act of def- the student union's act of defiance. Of the student of the administration's clamp down on on protest. Anyways, in, basically in the many many elements of the story, but they ultimately get a student tribunal to uh, to suspend me. The student tribunalists who agreed to giving me a, a month or a, a semester su- suspension, the next day they come out and they say publicly that they were basically pressured by the administration to adopt this suspension. But it holds the administration claims I do not fulfill my suspension, and they so they resuspend me. They say they say I don't fulfill my suspension again. So then they expelled me from the university. My argument for not fulfilling the suspension was I was re-elected the next year. I was re-elected uh, to the council of the Concordia Student Union 
And so they actually brought in the cops into a council meeting to arrest me, to take me out of the building uh, because they said I was suspended and therefore not allowed to go on campus. And I was saying, well, I was just fulfilling my duty as an elected representative of the student union. And we claimed there was even sort of legal jurisprudence that suggested that as an elected representative, you had the right to be on the uh, on the space. Anyways, the, the whole thing actually ultimately, we actually ultimately took it all the way to the uh, to try to take it to the Supreme Court of Canada, the Supreme Court refused to uh, to intervene and, and over over uh, overturn the administration's decision. But yeah, so I was a uh, I was effectively expelled from the university for a, a mix of factors, partly tied to the Netanyahu protests, partly tied to a series of other things that were connected to the to the Netanyahu protests. Well, you know, people can say that uh, it turned out pretty well for you, didn't it? In the end, yeah, not I today. Never- I never finished my degree. I still, I still have five classes left for my BA in uh, <laughs> political science, but uh, I don't, I don't feel like, I don't feel like I miss it. So, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, now, now you're you're a published author. You published eleven books. You contribute to many newspapers: the Globe and Mail, the uh, the Toronto Star, right? And um, you've you've written for many newspapers. So, I mean, I guess it, in the end of the day, it, it turned out well for you. So we're going to ask you about, we're obviously going to talk about Israel-Palestine, you know, later. But for now, let, let's go to the, to the next, you know, thing that you're known for. Um, tell us about, and I quote, Pettigrew lies, Haitians die. What was that about? Yeah, in 2005, uh, about a year after Canada helped overthrow Haiti's elected government, uh, alongside uh, French oh. and uh, Americans, uh, Canadian troops were uh in Port-au-Prince, the night that elected President Jean Bertrand Aristide was um, was physically removed from the country by U.S. Marines, Canadian troops were were uh, at the airport that night, uh, and Canada helped in um, instigating the coup, uh, and then helped, you know, sub- substantially, but but uh, really after the coup. And there was a coup government. There was an individual who had been living in Florida for 15 years, uh, Gérald Latortue, who was put in place to basically be the ruler of Haiti. Uh, of course, the real rulers were the U.S., France, and uh, Canada. Um, and in the aftermath of the coup, there were thousands of people killed. There were hundreds and hundreds of people uh, put in jail, political prisoners. I, I had the opportunity to go to Haiti in December of 2004, I went to the prison where I met people like Soan, who was a well-known uh, singer, uh, political singer and, and uh, activist uh, who was jailed. And I met people who had uh, who had family members killed because the, they came for them uh, after the coup because they were associated with the uh, ousted government. Um, and uh, Pettigrew organized, uh, or the Canadian government organized this conference in uh, in uh, Montreal in uh, June of 2005, where they uh, it was a conference on Haiti. And basically, uh, we went my, myself and uh, Aaron Maté, who was on the Concordia Student Executive with me back a few years earlier. Wow, you you were with Aaron Maté? He's he's a really known figure. Like he goes on the on the Jimmy Dore show all the time, for example, and he has his own show. I think he interviewed Normal Finkelstein. Uh, he's some he's a very interesting figure. I, I'm surprised uh, you you went to school with him. Yeah, he was in this. He was in the same Concordia Student Union executive. Wow! Uh, but anyway, we went, we went to Haiti together too in uh, in December of two thousand four, and so we went to this. We were already getting active uh, against Canada's role in Haiti, and we went to this conference that the King government was organizing at, on Haiti. And the night before, I went to this conference. It was like this this like uh, dinner uh, the night before the conference was really starting. And it was really disgusting. It was like these speeches that acted like everything was fine and Canada was just bringing help and aid and all this, you know, it was just total government kind of propaganda. And so at this event, we decided that the next day there was going to be a concluding press conference for the whole conference. And so we decided we, you know, we needed to do something beyond just, you know, attending and watching, but we should, you know, take an action. And we decided that we would, uh, we would put uh, fake blood on Pettigrew's hands. And, uh, and so I did, I put, I, in the midst of when he began speaking at the press conference, I walked up and I poured a uh, fake blood, which was uh, some red dye and cranberry juice on his hands. And I said, uh, Pettigrew lies, Haitians die, Pettigrew uh, in French is uh, Pettigrew menteur, les haïtiens meurent. Uh, and his, uh, his security staff came, came at me pretty, pretty quickly. And, uh, and chucked me out of the room. And uh, we also had people who had and came in with banners that showed, you know, saying Pettigrew lies, Haitians die. So it was a very successful political stunt. Uh, it got the question of Canada's support for violence in Haiti 
into the dominant media in a way that was, you know, had been very difficult to do. So we really did break through the the media kind of uh, kind of blackout, which was obviously the objective. Uh, I had they sent me to jail, and I was in jail for uh, uh, I think about a day and a half, about a day, about a day for for that. Um, yeah, so it was a it was a good political action, and it's something that I think there's a, there's a need to be the need for a lot more of, right? When, when the Canadian government is supporting, you know, is involved directly in killing people, and through Canadian aid was training and supporting the police force that was killing people at demonstrations in Haiti. Uh, Canadian diplomats would never say, never criticize the violence uh, being perpetrated by this government that we were backing and its security forces. Uh, the Canadian government, there was Canadian troops on the ground in Haiti for, for six months. Canada was pressuring UN officials to be more uh, violent and aggressive in clamping down on the uh, on the neighborhoods, the impoverished neighborhoods that were supportive of the ousted uh, president. Uh, um, so, so I think uh, you know I've I've done similar type of political uh, interventions in you know in recent years. Well, prior to the pandemic, we had this this network called the Disruption Network Canada, where we where we uh, disrupted Justin Trudeau uh, numerous times for his policy on Palestine, his policy in Venezuela. We disrupted Christian Freeland, the former foreign minister around Venezuela. We disrupted the defense minister around, uh, you know, the, the, the military, militarist policies. So it, these are these are kind of, we, you know, I think, we you know, we want to be um, you know, nonviolent, but we want to be clear with the politicians that there are people who are against these policies. And also from the standpoint, from the from a media standpoint, when the dominant media uh, largely refuses to cover these issues, you have to you have to go a little bit further than just putting out a press release that they ignore. You have to you know be there. And, and, and I'm part of a group called the Solidarité Québec Haïti. We all, which also disrupted a number of Trudeau, a couple of other ministers uh, on a couple of occasions, uh, and we were able to, you know, break through a little bit into the dominant media by being present at their press conferences and, and directly uh, challenging their undemocratic policies. Mr. Engel, I have a quick question. Uh, that was supposed to be for reserve for Canada and Africa and the mining exploitation going on over there, but. Um, according to the government of Canada, the main objective of Canada in Africa are the following. So providing development assistance, uh, promoting democracy, promoting peace and security, and finally increasing commercial uh, commercial and economic ties. So that was Canada's statement to Africa. And uh, as we saw with mining company, that's probably not true. And so um, what's the image that Canada is trying to build with Haiti and why um, what's the image it's projecting in the dominant media and what's the other image that's actually doing like boots on the ground? Yeah, I mean, invariably, they present what they're doing uh, as trying to help as, you know, benevolent, right? And I think that read, reading that list of, around Canadian policy in Africa is illustrative of that point in that there is no doubt the primary objective of Canada's role in Africa in most countries, not everyone, you got to go specific each, each one, and, and those things vary at different times. But the primary objective in most countries on the continent is to advance the profits of Canadian mining companies, right? So if they were to put that same list out and say, our number one objective is to en- enhance the profit margin of uh, of Toronto Stock Exchange listed corporations or, you know, Vancouver based mining corporations that wouldn't portray what they're doing. And, you know, that would that would seem very self-serving rather than being sort of, you know, benevolent and internationalist and, and whatnot. So that's why they they couch the reality of their policy in the last point about, you know, commercial relations, which is a little bit vague about, you know, what the exact objective is. So, so in, in the case of uh, Canada's role in Haiti, I mean, Canada has been, uh, I'm doing a book about the history of Canada's role in Haiti going back, you know, 200 plus years. And, and Canada has always aligned with, you know, very clearly since the 1950s with the interests of, you know, Washington led domination in the country and going back, you know, previously. And ha- Haiti is a country that has been probably definitely no country in the hemisphere that has been more imperially dominated by the U.S. since the U.S. occupied in 1915, right? So last since 1915, Haiti has been essentially a protectorate of the U.S. U.S. formerly troops ran the place for 20 years, kept control of the, the finances of the country for another 10 years, and then have re- reinvaded on multiple occasions since then. So Canada has Canadian policy, uh, which has become ever more important in Haiti uh, since about 2003 and, and the coup in 2004. Since then, Canada has really been the second power in Haiti. 
historically the second power, well, historically the main power was France, of course, but then since the U.S. occupation, the second power has been has been France. Canada is now second behind the U.S. as as the uh, as a dominant player in the country. And you know the the motivation of what Canada Canadian policy in Haiti is about, you know, it's a bit it's a bit complicated. The primary motivation is alignment with the U.S. and alignment with um, with Washington's policy. Uh, but secondarily, there there are Canadian corporate interests, mining interests, which have have you know had prospecting rights for ten percent of Haitian territory at one point. Uh, one of the things that came out of the two thousand four coup was a, a change of the mining policy to uh, better enable uh, uh, foreign mining companies, which are mostly Canadian, to operate. Uh, but probably more important than, than the mining sector has been, it basically, it's a sweatshop. The thing that Haiti produces is apparel, right? You know, T-shirts and, and socks and, you know, whatever. And they don't even, they don't even, the, the sort of economic situation is so bad, they don't even actually produce the full T-shirt necessarily. They do the labor-intensive part, right? So so because electricity is so expensive in Haiti because the their electricity network is you know, so poor and dysfunctional, the more labor intensive part gets maybe done in the Dominican Republic, or so the more energy intensive part gets done in the Dominican Republic. And then just the stitching part gets brought into Haiti because the wages are so low, the, the companies can pay the, the workforce, you know, a dollar and a half, uh, $2 a day. And so Canadian companies like uh, Montreal based Guild and Activewear, it's been the second biggest employer in Haiti in Haiti over the past 10, 15 years, uh, either directly or indirectly through its subcontractors. Um, and so they're very hostile to any effort to increase the minimum wage, right? So one of the reasons why they overthrew the Aristide government in 2004 was because the Aristide government doubled the minimum wage. And the the sweatshop companies, I mean, their whole you know model of you know why they're in Haiti is because it has the absolute lowest wages in the hemisphere. And so, so it's a, it's a, in, you know, a hyper, hyper exploitative model. And, and so Canadian, Canadian capital, Canadian uh, companies are, are aligned with this policy, which has been you know, articulated repeatedly by U.S. Canadian quote unquote development officials or aid officials, which is basically that Haiti's comparative advantage is low wages, well, that's another way of saying Haiti's comparative advantage or its its economic model is impoverishment, right? So it's like, so we should keep, Haiti shouldn't, it shouldn't increase its minimum wage because its comparative advantage in global economics is low wages. But that's just another way of saying that Haiti will never develop, right? It just will always be, you know, you know highly impoverished. But that is the reality of, of, you know, today and the whole power structure within Haiti both with regards to you know countries like the U.S. and Canada, but also with regards to the ruling elite in Haiti, is they're tied into this model where they produce almost nothing. The things they do produce are these are uh, you know apparel, cheap cheap T-shirts, and they pay they pay the employees you know two dollars a day, or maybe it's up to four dollars now, but very very small uh, pittance. Be, you know, myself being from from uh, Bangladesh, I know a thing or two about the textile industry and like cheap labor, right? And uh, on one of th- another thing, I also know is that in those countries, nothing can be done without you know greasing a few palms, right? But there are laws in Canada against this, like in the Criminal Code and the Corruption of Foreign uh, Public Officials Act. You cannot bribe foreign officials, and uh, like you can face um, serious. A punishment for that, as uh, Asim Silabana was, for example, accused of, you know, bribing uh, foreign uh, officials in Libya and, and the Gaddafi government for uh, certain contracts uh, or like receiving bribes, and uh, people had to step down. So there are laws against it. But how do corporations and like Canadian mining companies, for example, how do how do they get away? Um, and corporate interests in general, how do they get away with bribing foreign officials? Well. Uh, you mentioned SNC in, 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 in Libya. I mean, that was the one that got the most attention, but SNC was found to have been paying bribes in like, you know, a dozen countries, including in, in, in Bangladesh. It is a whole long list of a whole bunch of, I mean, there was allegations that were never, you know, proven in court. And then there were ones that, that were, you know, beyond just allegations. And that's part of why the World Bank withdrew uh, SNC's status as a, uh, a possible recipient of World Bank uh, contracts until for for quite a while. And that actually, the World Bank just got rid of that recently. Canada has actually been very lax on prosecuting Canadian companies bribing officials elsewhere. Right? Uh, I've quoted um, 
the pre, uh, SNC Lavalin, uh, the predecessor, uh, it was SNC and Lavalin. I forget, it, I forget which one it was. I think it was SNC uh, and the former top executive back in as late as like the late nineties was openly saying that bribes that they made internationally were made to made sure to ask for a receipt because they could, they could write them off. They were tax deduct- deductible in Canada. So, so Canada was very, very uh, like when the U S U S legislation around uh, bribing foreign officials was brought in uh, sometime in like the 1970s and uh, Canada didn't bring their legislation until way later. And then the first prosecution under the act um, doesn't happen until like, I forget the exact year, but like 2010 or 2008 or 2006. It's like it takes like more than a decade of uh, the legislation existing, and si- even since then, there's been lots of uh, discussion about how very little resources are put into uh, investigating the matter by by Canadian police. Um, so Canada has been viewed historically. Harper government faced a lot of pressure on that that issue and, and did improve uh, some of the legislation. And, and that's part of that prominent case against SNC for their, its role in, in Libya. That's part of you know where, where that comes out of the improvements on some of the legislation in Canada. But yeah, I mean, the government has shown a high degree of ambivalence to the issue of you know direct corruption, but a but high degree of ambivalence more generally around what came companies do abroad, right? Like that's part of the reason why the mining sector is so big in Canada the, the global mining sector, which is something like, according to government statistics, is 75% of the world's mining companies are listed in Canada, right? Or are based here. 75%. Canada's 0.5% of the world's population, right? That's, that's uh, you know, 150 times Canada's proportion of global population, right? That is, you know, insane. It, it doesn't make any sense, uh, except if you start investigating, you know, some of the, some of the, you know, the underlying reasons. And one of those underlying reasons is that, they can't be held accountable or historically have not been able to be held accountable in Canadian courts for their abuses abroad. So the Canadian government provides all these different forms of support, the Canadian mining sector in Ecuador, in Ghana, in Burkina Faso, Canadian government provides all these forms of support, but those companies can't be you know, held accountable in Canadian courts for, for you know, killing people, destroying the environment, uh, whatnot. Now there's some, there's some court cases that are, breaking that down and that that's being you know challenged within um within the you know court system but the u.s has legislation that's much uh clearer on that issue and that goes back i think even a couple of centuries the u.s um uh, legislation i'm forgetting the name of it right now so yeah i mean you know i the simple answer to the question i think is just that the the political system uh is heavily influenced by the companies that want to be don't want to be held accountable for bribing abroad or abuses abroad. And therefore the political system, you know, enables uh, these company companies to engage in corruption and different forms of abuses abroad. Right. And this is interesting because the, what you just explained, for example, is not something you learn in school. It's not something you learn as being a part of, you know, a Canadian citizen day to day. You know, humorist Mike Cord said that uh, Canada is a uh, service traiteur, you know, where the, our soldiers are caterers. And like the U.S. is like the big bully. They invade. And Canada, we're like the peacekeepers. We're, we're, we're the caterers. Right. But, you know, in your in your book, uh, Canada and Africa, 300 years of aid and exploitation, you basically disprove that you 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 uh, myth, you do some myth busting. So explain how um, like can, the, this ethos like of, of Canada being like a, a benevolent actor in the world is not true. Well, I mean that's uh, I've written now uh, nine books that have been published that in one way or another deal with that, and a couple more that are about to be published. So that, that's a big that's a big uh, question to answer. But I mean it, it goes from A to it is that. I mean, you know, if you look at the wars that Canada's fought uh, from sending troops to Sudan in 1884 to the Boer War of uh, 1899 to 1902 to World War One to World War Two, the Korean War to the first Iraq War to bombing of uh, former Yugoslavia to uh, Afghanistan to Libya. There's only one war that Canada's fought that you can make a case was morally justifiable. And that's World War II. World War II, while, you know, there's lots of back history that it should never have, ha- World War II should never have happened if Canada, and Britain and other countries wouldn't have uh, enabled fascism in Spain and wouldn't have gone along with Japanese uh, 
uh, interventionism in China. And, and, you know, there's all these things that we did that enabled the rise of fascism that, that shouldn't have been done. And there's all, all kinds of ways in which World War II was fought that were, were clearly immoral in terms of, you know, bombing German cities and uh, all kinds of things like that. But at the crux of it, World War II, all, once the situation was where the situation was, it was justifiable war. But it is the only justifiable war that Canada has been involved in. All the other wars are, are just, are you know, uh, everything from, you know, total insanity, like World War I, where you just, you know, just tens of millions are killed for what, to clear imperialism like Libya in 2011. So then, and then, then if you actually take it, if you investigate the peacekeeping missions, what were what are you know de- popularly defined as the peacekeeping missions, or you know I should always mention Korean War because you know Korean War is like three to four million people that were killed, right? And it's not to say that there was no you know no issue at hand, but basically we took what was an intra-Korean conflict and we just massively expanded it to the point where three or four million people killed. Where they you know at one point they stopped bombing North Korea because it, every building of more than one story was destroyed. That's you know the U.S. with who we were fighting with but so yeah so you so you take a look at what we define as the peacekeeping missions popularly defined well in 2004 when canada helped overthrow haiti's elected government that was a un became a un peacekeeping mission canada had troops as part of the un peacekeeping mission that was clearly a, a form of imperialism that was something that most haitians rejected and it 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 undercut haitian democracy it undercut haitian sovereignty i Ultimately, the UN forces even brought cholera into the country and killed, which led to tens of thousands of people being killed in the terrible cholera outbreak because the UN forces cared so little about Haitian life that they were just dumping their feces in water systems that people were drinking from. And that's where the cholera got introduced into Haiti. To, you know, another UN peacekeeping mission that that Canada was a big part of in the Congo in the early 1960s, well, that UN peacekeeping mission, Canadians within that peacekeeping mission played an important role in undermining Patrice Lumumba, who was Congolese elected uh, prime minister, who was you know, an anti-colonial figure, uh, and who was ultimately assassinated, in great part because of the policies that Canadian peacekeepers pursued alongside Belgium and, and American officials. So even when you look at actual peacekeeping, what is defined as peacekeeping, there's often more to the story. I mean, or you take you take the where peacekeeping became a you know popular thing when Lester Pearson uh, wins the Nobel Peace Prize for supposedly introducing peacekeeping. Well, that's 1956 in Egypt with the Suez Crisis, and basically what happens there is Israel, Britain, and France invade Egypt because they're uh, they're angry with Nasser for nationalizing. Suez Canal and basically pursuing a more independent uh, policy opposing French rule in Algeria, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Washington opposes that invasion. And Washington doesn't oppose that invasion because it, it, it cares about Egyptian sovereignty or cares about you know children being killed by the foreign invasion. It opposes the invasion because at that point, it was in a bit of a competition with Moscow over the sort of newly independent Arab countries, and it wanted to portray itself as being anti-colonial, i.e. anti-French and British, who were the main colonial powers. Um, uh, and, and so it's in a bit of a competition with Moscow over that. But also, more importantly, it wanted to tell the former colonial powers, Britain and France, there was a new boss in the region, i.e. Washington is now the dominant player. You're, you ain't going to invade Egypt Without without us, you know, giving you the okay to do that, and so the point of the of the peacekeeping mission that Lester Pearson came came up with was to get um, basically get Britain. There was a, uh, a disagreement between London and Washington, and uh, Canada had been traditionally close to London. It was increasingly close to Washington, and it basically wanted to you know end the division within NATO uh, between London, uh, Paris, and Washington over the issue and it basically wanted to help the British extract the British from this catastrophic decision that they had made, which was causing this huge, you know, huge division with, uh, between uh, Washington and London. So Pearson wasn't concerned about Egyptian children. He wasn't con- concerned about Egyptian sovereignty. He was concerned about division between Washington and London, between the main imperial uh, powers that Canada was tied to. 
and uh, and he's open about that. It's not it's not doesn't hide it. He says that openly at the time, right? But the mythology has turned turned into this whole other form of Canada benevolence, internationalism, trying to you know help the world's children. And it's really just become a it's just a cover. How effective it today is it just it gives a blank check to the policymakers for what they want to do abroad. If we assume, if Canadians, the population assumes the best of our decision makers when they engage in international affairs, we basically just let them do what they want to do because we just presume they're going to do you know, what's right. But in practice, the evidence is just overwhelming that, in fact, what they do usually is they advance the interests of empire, historically British, today American, and they advance the interests of corporate Canada. That is what overwhelmingly drives Canadian foreign policy. But what we get told is, you know, peacekeeping, aid, helping the poor children of Haiti or of, you know, wherever. Yeah, you mentioned the Swiss Canal crisis. We'll be talking about all about Israel in, in a minute. Just before that, there's one last question I ask, uh, like to, to end this, this whole um, uh, colonial phase of the interview. Is I've always been a little bit confused about... Um, the the left's view the like the i i know there's no like singular left like there's a lot of different uh, ideologies on the left but uh, in general like a broad view of foreign policy you mentioned for example canada's involvement in world war ii and quote opposing fascism and like you said that if britain and france never let for example spain turn fascist it you know a lot of things could have been uh, avoided uh, i want to ask you like the how like how how would those countries could those countries have prevented um, Spain from turning fascist, for example, because obviously there was a civil war and uh, Nazi Germany and uh, fascist Italy stood by the nationalist side, the Francoist side, and France and Britain basically said, we don't want any part of this, like we're not going to intervene. And uh, there's generally like a, a division, as I said, on the on the right between on foreign policy. There's like what I call the neoconservative faction that says that we have to intervene everywhere, be the like the world police and the West. Like you know, we should spread our ideals, you know, and exploit resources abroad. And then there's a libertarian view that says that no, we should not intervene. Uh, we should leave people alone, and, and unless we get attacked, we won't intervene. What is what would you say would be like a left wing view, a broad broader left wing view of the foreign policy? For example, you mentioned opposing fascism there. Yeah, I mean that that's a that's a complicated question and that is a uh, in my book Left Right Marching to the Beat of Imperial Canada which is looking at the left how the left institutions unions NDP have uh, gone along with Canadian imperialism. I put forward the the idea of do no harm which would be more of the sort of you know the ice would be viewed as like the isolationist I, I, that's not what I'm not exactly what I'm presenting but more of the isolationist that don't you know don't intervene kind of kind of direction. That, I think, is an important frame that we should be looking at foreign policy decisions of, you know, from a medical kind of perspective of doing no harm and the Hippocratic Oath and uh, whatnot. I think that the ethos of our political culture is overwhelmingly across the political spectrum of more intervention, whether it be more Canadian aid, more Canadian peacekeepers, more or at the hard militarist end, more NATO missions, and that that's uh, quite problematic or now every issue is specific. Uh, I don't, there aren't, there aren't just, uh, you know, general rules that, that uh, I think there's some broad principles that we should look at, uh, we should keep in mind, but then we have to look at the specifics of each, of each instance. So uh, yeah, I mean, and, and to, and to answer, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, a have a great deal of expertise on um, the different decisions that were all made in, in uh, with regards to uh, Franco's coup efforts in Spain in the 1930s. But Canada's opposition, Canada's siding with fascism, and, you know, they don't claim that they, that's what they were doing, but, I mean, they, they, they were trying to block Canadians who, as, who as individuals were, you know, went over to Spain to, to fight against fascism right they brought they brought in legislation to the foreign enlistment act to uh to try to block canadians from fighting uh so they did all kinds of efforts to disrupt canadians as private individuals from doing what they could to oppose uh oppose fascism on the other side in the pacific i mean canada was providing all kinds of war materials to the japanese uh minerals and for war materials as they were you know consolidating their imperial domination in the region and operating a very, uh, you know, fascistic policies. So Canada was, I mean, enabling 
I mean, it wasn't just a matter of Canada didn't do enough to oppose the rise of fascism. There was ways in which they were were enabling. And, and, and you know, if you look at Mackenzie King's uh, prime minister, you know, he was quite sympathetic to to Hitler, right? In his in his diary, I mean, uh, he meets with Hitler in 1937, and he has very positive things to say about uh, about Hitler at that time. Because 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 I think you got to remember at the time the big concern was more the the, the Soviet Union right the, the you know was Russia and I mean Canada even fought I mean in 1918 1919 Canada fought to undermine the Bolshevik uh, uh, revolution right I mean we sent troops thousands of troops some you know the initial claim was we were we were fighting to oppose the Bolshevik revolution because we wanted to uh, have the uh, you know a second front in, in World War one but even after World War one was done we we dispatched uh, more troops to 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 fight against the uh, Bolsheviks in, in in Russia so that was the big worry it wasn't the Nazis it wasn't it wasn't the fascists it was more we were more concerned with the communists. So that, that contributed to World War II. It's, un, you know, it's undeniable that that was, you know, a very important part. And that's, we shouldn't, you know, ignore that, ignore that history. Now, how do you, how do you, you know, navigate those questions with, you know, going forward with policy, uh, you know, when should we intervene and when we shouldn't intervene in different international affairs? I think that we need to step back a big step in terms of caution. I, I wouldn't go to the, I wouldn't say there's no instance where we could intervene, be it be it, you know, militarily or otherwise, but we need to be way, way more reluctant than we are. In, in my uh, Black Book of Canadian Foreign Policy, I do suggest, I guess, one, you know, kind of proposal in that direction. That's the, basically that, you know, right now it's the Security Council that approves UN peacekeeping missions. Well, the Security Council is, you know, it's not the most democratic uh, forum. In the case of Haiti in 2004, the Caribbean community, and uh, quite aggressively, and the African Union a little bit more passively, they bought, which about, I think it's about 65, 70 countries, pretty good proportion of the United Nations General Assembly, they both opposed the coup in 2004. So, so in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the book, I, I suggest that Canada should, should only send troops in UN missions if it has the approval, not of the Security Council, but of the entire General Assembly, right? A bit more of a democratic forum uh, for those kind of decisions. And, you know, that that wouldn't deal with all the problems. There's still power imbalances within, you know, General Assembly or whatever. But but I think there's, you know, those are some of the kind of reforms that we can go or some of the steps you can make in a certain direction of ultimately you would want to change the structure of the United Nations, of course. But in the, you know, in the meantime, Canada can take a much more passive, more reluctant, if you want to call it isolationist or or I would call it a do no harm position to uh, and certainly to military intervention. Uh, Mr. Angler, before we finish off with Canada imperialism, colonialism, and especially since we're talking about World War II, I wanted to touch a bit on Canada's role in NATO a bit, and also how you said that NATO was never about a defensive uh, mission to to protect them from military harm, but it was really a uh, an organization against communism and against Russia, which was never really a threat. So can you explain a bit uh, Canada's interest in NATO and how it got started, and why did Canada participate in in, in NATO in the first place? Yeah, I mean, uh, Canada, some people suggest that NATO was even a Canadian idea, but Canada was part of the three countries that established NATO in the, in the initial secret meetings were between U.S., Canadian, and, and uh, British officials. I think NATO was established basically for two reasons. One was to defend the uh, Western European countries, which were... Uh, when I say defend, uh, maybe not the right word, but to basically protect the the governments there from uh, domestic socialist communist movements, which were very strong after World War II. There was a, quite a strong sense that, you know, communism was the way of the future. The traditional elites, the church, landowners, wealthy capitalists were, were you know, very much discredited because they had backed uh, Mussolini in Italy, Hitler... In France, they had, you know, collaborated. So, so the, you know, communist parties in Italy probably would have won the initial election after World War II uh, if it wasn't for outside intervention, American-led. In France, I believe they had, you know, 30% more of the vote. They had a number of ministers in the government. So what NATO was, was basically a way to strengthen 
the resolve of the uh, elite sectors in those countries and kind of say, hey, we're behind you here. You know, the U.S., Canada, Britain, we're behind you. We're going to we're going to dispatch troops. And, they, they, you know, they, they had troops occupying those, those countries and you know, kept troops in those uh, in Western European countries. Uh, so that was part of what NATO was about. And, and Lester Pearson was open about that in the House of Commons. I, I've quoted this speech a number of times where, where he, he uh he says that uh, the communist threat, uh, they, they pick off, I don't have the words right in front of me, but they basically they pick up, pick off all the different institutions. They go from like the, the unions to the schools, to the, to the teachers organizations. And then it even mentions kindergartens, right? So like the, the communists are going to like take over the kindergartens. It was, you know, really, and then he says that that's the point of NATO is to stop this sort of communist advancement. So that's part of it. And then the second part of what NATO was about was that the colonial powers were weakened after World War II. Um, and it was about uh, strengthening their grip uh, in Africa and different parts of Asia. Uh, and and Canada provided uh, in NATO mutual assistance in, from 1950 to 58, uh, something like I think it's a $1.4 billion, which works, works out to about something like seven or $8 billion today of weaponry free to the NATO countries. So when the French were suppressing the uh, Algerian independence movement, where there was like 400,000 French troops in, in Algeria in, in like the mid 1950s, Canada was providing bullets to the French, knowing, knowing full well where those bullets were being used and they actually ch- changed some of the legislation that that enabled those the weapons transfers to provide greater flexibility for the French to to use the to use the weapons, you know, same thing when the when the Brit the Brits were uh, suppressing the Mau Mau revolt in uh, in Kenya, uh, where you know tens and tens of thousands were killed, and it was even more, you know, hundreds of thousands killed in, in Algeria by the French, and they they you know were providing the weaponry. So what what NATO was about in part was to reinforce the, you know, weakening colonial powers and to bring it under a U.S. led geopolitical umbrella, right? To bring it, move it, move this whole former, you know, British, French and and other colonial system, move it increasingly under a sort of Washington led empire, global order or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so that was really the, the objective of, of NATO. And can you, again, I, you know, in my Pier- in my book, Lester Pearson's Peacekeeping, The Truth May Hurt, I quote uh, Pearson saying these things openly at the time in the House of Commons, right? It, it wasn't it wasn't a secret. You know, it's morphed over the years. I don't think that's what, you know, NATO is not about stopping the left in France or in, in Italy today like it was then. But NATO is definitely still a tool of, you know, U.S. led uh, globe domination. Yeah, before we move on to the to the Israel part, that's actually something really interesting that that I I know is that in in Europe, um, I've, I've been to a few European countries, you know, Britain, Belgium, and so on. In Europe, the the, the word socialist or, or communist is not like people hear that and they're not like, oh my god, you know, like like here in North America, that's that's something that that happens in U.S. or Canada when someone uses the word socialist or communist, it's really usually more as a as a slur or like to like sl- label their opponent as, uh, especially from, you know on on the right uh, from the right. And but in Europe, a lot of the center left parties, like the left, the main left wing party uh, of, of like whether Germany or, or France, is the, the socialist party, right? Uh, that's something I've, I've noticed that the word like communist is really like, a, like or socialist is really like a, n- not something that that even the left here likes to attribute itself. Even the NDP like sometimes hesitates. A lot of the the NDP hesitates to use the word socialist to like label itself. Well, they they took they took the word socialist out of their uh, out of their charter. Or exactly, exactly. And you know, in France, the the Communist Party until very recently was getting quite a significant share of the vote until only, you know, I think it's collapsed in the last five, 10 years, but until, into the, into the late nineties, early two thousands, I think it was getting five, 10% of the vote or something like that. Yeah. The, the French communist party still, still controls a lot of, you know, municipalities in France, like lo- France, uh, like local governments, right. Uh, generally cities, cities do tend to lean more left. So, I mean, I guess that, that goes to show. What you just heard was part one of our interview with Mr. Yves Engler. Part two will be coming next Friday. Um, so we'll see you then.